Okay, so I guess we'll begin. Um, so the original speaker that was scheduled for this presentation uh, wasn't able to make it. So um, my talk actually got rejected, believe it or not. But the content is very, very similar to what this guy was going to present. So it's like a, it's a, it's an approximation. It's like 90% the, of the way there. Um, so we just decided to go ahead and keep the abstract as it was. Um, and I updated the title, but it's pretty much what we're going to talk about is a, it's a talk that targets both Android and iOS platforms um, with respect to technical risks and solutions. So if we look at the agenda, we're going to talk about the prevalence of app cracking. So the risks associated with hosting your code in an untrustworthy environment such as mobile. Uh, we're going to talk about some interesting studies uh, that I had done. We're then going to get into the meat of it and talk about the current threats and risks. And we're also going to talk about some, we're going to actually show some code examples and where to go for guidance. Um, and talk a little bit about the OWASP project that I'm recently started and heading up um, to sort of talk about this. Um, this sort of stuff that we're going to be talking about today directly speaks to the OWASP Mobile Top 10 2014 release candidate, which was released yesterday. Um, so this will be a, a primer for that sort of stuff that you need to worry about within OWASP Mobile Top 10 2014 as it relates to the new category of binary protection. Um, so pay attention. <laughs> uh, so let's start off and look at some recent studies of some interesting things that are happening in the wild. Well, let's take a step back and sort of look at the change to the threat landscape. So I actually was originally in OWASP as a web pen tester. Um, and over time what was happening was I was getting thrown more and more mobile apps. And I'm not a mobile app expert, or I wasn't at the time. So I was treating most of my mobile app pen tests as you would web apps, you know, doing all of the inspections of services. Um, but there were a few fundamental changes which weren't really understood. I didn't understand at the time when I started doing this maybe five years ago. So the traditional landscape is, you know, most of the web application vulnerabilities are stemming from malicious inputs. You know, if you're doing proper data validation and you're mitigating the OWASP top 10, you're probably going to hit most of the major issues. Um, and to mitigate those traditional risks, uh, we consider anything as untrustworthy which is coming in from the user's browser. And in order to make it trustworthy, we have to do some sort of inspection and validation using data validation controls on the server side. And as I learned through my history at Fortify, we have a set of secure coding techniques which OWASP recommends and endorses for how to implement these particular data validation controls. <laughs> okay. Um, and there aren't really any other sources of threats which are, con which are considered less likely to occur. Um, now, in the introduction of mobile computing, we still need to worry about the traditional sources of untrustworthy input um, coming from web browsers, particularly in the cases of hybrid apps on mobile, uh, which is great. But, so we still have to worry about secure coding techniques and implementing things correctly. Otherwise, we're still back to the same drawing board of the traditional vulnerabilities that OWASP specializes in. However, we're introducing new sources of untrustworthiness. So if you look at mobile applications, packaged software, embedded software, these are all places where you're hosting code um, in an environment in which you, the organization, have no control over who's going to see that code and what they may physically do with that code. Um, so it introduces a new source of uncertainty. So this gets back into the problem of integrity. So if we look at the, the problem definition of preserving the integrity of your apps, we have software in these untrustworthy, untrustworthy environments. You know, in theory, because you have physical access to that, you can easily reverse engineer the code, modify it, repackage it, send it out into the wild. Um, there's a whole host of different things that you can do. And we at ArcSan had done a bunch of studies uh, as well as looked at independent studies such as the North Carolina study in 2012 done by NCSU to see what people were doing with these applications out in the wilds. So 
Attackers have direct access to the binary and they can compromise the integrity of that binary using a whole host of tools that are freely available on the market. Um, and even the most expensive and exquisite tools on the market, such as IDA Pro, will only run you $3,500 a license, which for a nation state, that's trivial. Um, so these tools are easy to get. Um, and the, the, the uh, fallout from being able to modify these binaries is pretty drastic. The obvious is brand damage, revenue or intellectual property loss through reverse engineering. Um, and it, it sort of prompts the question of, you know, if we look at what the attackers or the crackers are interested in when they're looking at mobile apps, um, if you actually go out in the wild and analyze them, typically they're doing things like bypassing security controls that you've baked into your application, which is sitting on the client side. And typically, when I talk about security controls in the classic sense, we're worried about licensing. So we want them, we want to be able to crack a tool and get, you know, free music, free functionality. Um, we want to be able to bypass digital rights managements. Um, so that's one category of risk that results. Um, the other is exposure of sensitive application information. Keys, certificates, credentials that might be sitting within the code itself or within configuration files that are getting processed on the client side and passed to the server in some way. Uh, that's a huge problem within the geography of China, for instance. We have a lot of people who come to ArcSan specifically about China and hosting sensitive code within these environments in which somebody may have access to sensitive code directly. And just as a side note, in the case of China, um, they are totally within their rights um, to take the code off of your server in these data stores. And often what they do is they rip it apart, reverse engineer it, repackage it and sell it themselves. Um, and the victim is none the wiser as to what's going on. Uh, the other more classic attack that you see is tampering with critical business logic. So typically when we talk about that, we're talking about games. Uh, with games, you have all these cool add-ons and cool mods. Uh, I always think about the hot coffee mod, if anyone's played Grand Theft Auto. Um, <laughs> that one's particularly salacious and delicious, and uh, it obviously causes a lot of brand damage. Um, so that's another example of what we're talking about when we talk about binary attacks. Uh, and also, more disturbingly, we see a rise in insertion of malware and exploits in these applications which get reshipped off to the client. And typically, that malware will be in the form of Zeus. Um, it will typically be spyware, which is intercepting and modifying credentials or traffic on the fly. Or just simply intellectual property, or sorry, customer information theft. Um, so as discussed before, uh, proprietary algorithms is another popular avenue of attack. Um, typically more in, we think about IP theft in the case of firmware. So in firmware spaces, once again, you're hosting code in an, in an appliance or something that somebody may have physical access to. Um, and sure enough, they can reverse engineer and steal that intellectual property. Um, and, in, and typically you'll see that in military applications where a nation state will reverse engineer firmware for a missile guidance system, for instance, steal that intellectual property and basically produce their own missile guidance systems um, using that IP. And the more obvious of piracy and unauthorized distribution. So when I first started looking into this problem space, I wanted to know more about what people were saying out in the wild. Um, so IEEE Security and Privacy in 2012 did its own study of Android and found 86% of what was out there was repackaged forms of a legitimate app in the hopes that the victim would download it, not being the wiser of the legitimate versus, 90, versus the non-legitimate. Um, according to PricewaterhouseCoopers, they did their own study in 2012 and find, found 90% success rates with ethical hacks. Um, Frost and Sullivan in 2011, had also done its own analysis and said these were number one and number two threats to their particular organizations. So that was all well and good. Um, but when I joined ArcSan, I wanted to know more about what, did, what could we actually find if we looked at the top 100 apps um, for Android as well as iPhone. 
So what we did was we took a snapshot at a particular date and said, okay, what are the top 100 iTunes apps? What are the top Android apps? Can we, in fact, go out and find cracked versions of these apps out there? And in 2013, the numbers are pretty disturbing. For Android, 100% of the time, we were able to find cracked versions of those apps. For Apple, the numbers are slightly less, but still not exactly inspiring at a 56% crack rate. And that was for paid. Um, for unpaid, it, the story wasn't much different. Um, but in the case of paid, you know, if I can give you a free version of something and trick you into downloading and running it for free, in exchange you may get some spyware or malware. I hope you're okay with that. I'm not going to tell you that, but that's great if, you, if you're totally willing to buy that. Uh, sadly enough, that's the truth and that's what a lot of people fall for. So, so when we actually looked at and did a detailed analysis of these cracks, we found that they were bypassing security controls baked directly within the applications. There was tons of adware and spyware. Um, North Carolina State University did a really good study specifically of this particular question. You can go to the end, there's an NCSU study in 2012 um, where they do a much more detailed breakdown of the types of attacks that you see. Uh, once again, we saw repackaging and stealing of information about users within their own applications. So what I saw a lot of was, um, you know, even in hybrid apps, they were modifying the HTML layer, injecting just stupid stuff to transmit usernames and passwords to third-party sites. Really simple stuff, but very, very effective um, in this space. So we wanted to look also at the financial vertical in particular, and I wanted to know more about banking in particular. It's pretty disturbing. Uh, we looked at the top 35 Android banking apps for 2012, and we found four common themes. We found you could decompile every single application out there. You could effectively tamper and modify the code of every single app out there. And there were certain things like information leakage within the application itself via symbols and strings. So you could look at the, you could do a decompilation and see particularly sensitive methods and class fields and things which would be very tempting to modify or inspect if you were an attacker. Um, so, so we, so that's when I first started going into this problem space. I wanted to be sold on the legitimacy of the problem space. So really, you know, after I realized that this problem space is very legitimate, I had some real hesitations because as an application security consultant, I'm telling people things like, well, you know, you need to do these particular coding techniques and, um, you know, one of the questions I used to get asked a lot is, well, if we're doing, you know, certificate, we're doing, you know, certificate-based uh, secure communication with a server on the back end, what happens if somebody modifies these certificates or these signatures on the client sides? That was one example where I was like, okay, this is an integrity issue. And then it was like, crap, I don't really have a good story or a good recommendation around this. Um, so that sort of inspired me to start an OWASP project um, where we could share the technical expertise that my company has with the OWASP community as it relates to these risks, technical solutions as well. So the first thing I did was I reorganized the risks and what I wanted to do was I wanted to come up with a tree that describes the types of risks that you need to worry about. And it connects the business risks to the technical risk. And really what we're talking about in this problem space is violation of your code confidentiality as well as the code integrity as well. So there's a whole class of risks that relate to reverse engineering and code modification slash injection. So the next slide sort of, this is kind of the heart of this presentation. Um, so if you're, some people in the audience like to take pictures of the slides. So if you're going to, this is the slide to do it. Um, so what we do is uh, we, we came up with a, a technical list of technical risks. We connected them to the business risks so the business community could understand what these risks are, what they will mean for their company. Um, each particular risk on the OWASP project contains a detailed technical description 
It also describes technical recommendations for how to prevent these using different coding techniques. Um, and we also provide external references to studies and independent analysis that, sh that shows you the legitimacy of the problem. So we'll briefly go through these particular risks within code modification. Um, so one of the top risks that we saw which was most prevalent was repackaging. So a lot of you might have seen the Android uh, repackaging vulnerability. I went to the HP event last year where they dumped all of the details around the actual vulnerability itself. It was really interesting. But the, the point is, is what's happening is people are taking Android apps, tearing them apart, repackaging them with an entirely different app which has a similar look and feel perhaps and selling them directly on the stores. And sadly enough, they're very effective at it. Uh, and there's tons of fun studies that you can go out and see where it's very brazen, just total ripoffs of the original app repackaged. Typically they'll steal the entire intellectual property and reproduce everything from scratch. And what the hell, let's throw in some spyware while we're at it. Uh, yeah, it's pretty frightening. Um, and once again, you can go to the OWASP project and get much more detailed information than we can talk about due to the severely limited amount of time that I've got. I'm just going to briefly fly through the others. Um, method swizzling is another really big one which is common across both the Android and iOS environments. In method swizzling, um, essentially what we're doing is we are intercepting API calls and potentially changing the code which gets executed related to that particular method. Um, one of the common techniques with method swizzling for both Android and iOS is to swizzle a method which is passing credentials or d certificates or keys as parameters, stealing those keys or parameters and passing them off to the third party. Um, very, very simple but there's a whole host of other interesting and sort of fascinating things you can do. With method swizzling, if you can hook those API calls and execute your own custom code. Um, we'll get into swizzling with behavioral changes in the next slide. Um, as we mentioned earlier, security control bypass where if I can modify the binary itself, I can actually change the underlying assembly and have it simply skip over or change what a particular method is doing. So in the case of jailbreak detection or root detection for instance, if you have a method which is returning true or false for the status of jailbreak or roots, um, I can modify that to always return true or always return false, thus disabling the security control check um, fairly early on. Uh, presentation layer modification is another top risk for code modification where we're going to essentially modify the HTML, JavaScript or cascading style sheets within a hybrid app sitting on Android or iOS. Um, cryptographic key replacement or interception is another huge one um, where you think you're decrypting or encrypting something locally on the device. You're using a set of common standard implementations um, that an attacker will know about or and you're using standard representations or industry standard representations of those keys in memory. So I as an attacker I'm going to inject myself into that memory space, observe those standard representations for keys, intercept and steal your keys that way. Um, and through the theft of the key typically we'll get access to will violate the data security controls on the client side or even the server side and get all sorts of interesting information um, that should be protected. So here's an example with Swizzlin. Um, this particular example is iOS um, but it's totally applicable to Android as well. Um, where we see in this case we are logging in, we're calling an actual method where we are passing the username and password and the reality is is that if I'm an attacker, I'm going to perform method swizzling on that method uh, and steal your username and password that way and then return flow of execution back to the normal. So the victim is never going to know that that username and password was transmitted to a third party site. Uh, we're actually on a slightly related note, um, I'm actually working, because of my background with Fortify and static analysis, I'm actually looking at some rules around identifying areas where this type of stuff may be prevalent in your source code. Um, so that's, that's, 
that's something which is in the works. Um, very exciting stuff to help you identify these types of issues that I'm highlighting. Here's another example with automated jailbreak bypass um, where this particular, believe it or not, we actually saw this in a banking app um, where they were passing, they wanted to know whether they were running in a jailbroken environment. They were doing what 90% of people do out there and simply checking for the existence of Cydia.app. In this case, there are several different interesting ways you can attack this. For instance, you could, if you wanted to, simply modify the assembly to always return false. Um, simply by do your malware could basically inject in the binary, modify it, and break it that way. One of the more interesting and easy, lazier ways of doing it is if you can intercept the NS file manager file exist as path method, you can in fact always have it return false in this case. So if I can say, if I can have it execute my file exists as path method, and if I can check the parameter and say, oh, you're looking for Cydia, no, it doesn't exist, always return false in that case. Otherwise, go back to the normal stack and execute the original method. Um, that's another way of breaking this. Um, and we have a whole host of recommendations around. In that particular case, if you wanted to, if you wanted to bypass or stop someone from method swizzling, you would need to execute, I think it's system hook 80 hex uh, on your iPhone device in order to stop, in order to prevent someone from call, in order to execute the method directly rather than calling it through a library. Because once you call through a library, that's where interception occurs. Um, if you wanted to remediate the original problem, which I'd recommended or described, regarding assembly modification, you would need to do a checksum of the actual code um, which is calling the is jailbroken environment method. And you would probably want to have multiple layers of defense in depth where you're doing multiple integrity checks against other guards or controls which are doing integrity checks. Uh, we'll get into that later. So that is a brief flavor of the uh, control flow modification issues that you may run into or code integrity issues. You also have issues related to the confidentiality of the data itself with reverse engineering. So these are all fairly standard. You can take your binaries and inspect them and do a strings or you can look at O tool on OSX and you can very quickly in Android convert your, you can do a dex to jar and convert your dex bytecode back to Java and inspect all sorts of things which are being exposed, um, such as method signatures, data symbols. String tables is another one which is huge. If I can, um, the number of times I've been able to successfully crack stuff just by looking at string tables, looking at the strings which are stored in your binaries, you can identify all sorts of tantalizing things that are using those strings. So for instance, if I can see Cydia.app sitting in your string table, I want to say, okay, which API methods are actually using those particular strings? And then quickly I can identify the code that's actually doing that jailbreak detection and tamper with it, modify it, disable it. There's a whole host of different things. Um, the other disturbing one on this list is uh, application decryption where, you know, Apple goes so far so as to provide you as part of the iTunes store um, they'll provide you a whole set of code encryption to prevent someone from reverse engineering. Unfortunately, their code encryption is easy to defeat. Um, so if I'm the attacker, I'm going to download the app onto a jailbroken device, run a tool such as Clutch. These are all freely available tools. Um, Clutch will, is a really nice tool for breaking the decryption. We can talk more about it later um, if you guys want to talk about it. And here are some examples of cryptographic key theft where we are storing hard-coded keys within the source code itself. Once again, you can do a string table analysis. Um, there are standard representations for encryption keys as well as encryption algorithms um, that you should be avoiding. So in this case, we can steal the keys that way. Um, Anti-debugger checks is another one which prevents reverse engineering where at particular entry points within your code, you need to check for the presence of debuggers. That in itself is not trivial. There are a whole host of different things that you need to do and worry about and be clever um, when trying to detect the presence of a debugger. 
Uh, we can talk about that later. So the practical solutions to our problems. Within your mobile apps, you need to prevent static and dynamic analysis. So you need to prevent reverse engineering. You need to stop someone from being able to crack it, break the decryption, perform reverse engineering using something like Ida Pro or Hopper. Um, at runtime, you need to stop people from being able to inject their debuggers into your processes. Now that's an interesting one because there are some people who actually want to be able to do that. Uh, and that can be a design flaw within your application which encourages dynamic analysis. Uh, so this is a trade-off between functionality and protection. Um, your application, you need it to also be able to detect code modification at runtime. So you could do things like integrity checks and respond accordingly if those integrity checks fail for particular methods or sections of your code. You don't want to do integrity checks across your entire image due to performance reasons. Typically people don't do that. They typically zoom in on just very small portions. Uh, and you also want to protect the protection device controls themselves because if someone detects your particular integrity violation control, um, they're going to crack that and you've got to have other people which are watching that as well. Uh, and you can, there's a whole host of interesting things that we can talk about. And when you detect these things at runtime, you can respond in a, a host of different ways. Um, some people like to phone home, some don't. You can do things like subtle degradation in performance, returning of error levels. Uh, I've actually had clients who actually alert directly and just throw a message box on the screen. I think that's pretty dumb. Uh, but it's useful for people in the field if they need to identify and diagnose problems. Um, there's a whole art to that um, which we'll be talking about in the project. You also need to implement all of these integrity controls using a defense in depth approach. So this is an actual working example of a military application hosted on a mobile device. Um, in this particular case, our code is at the bottom. We have particular segments of code which we're protecting. We have different levels of coding controls which are included which protect the layers below them. Um, so for instance, here we have an anti-debug guard and with the anti-debug guard, we are invoking a check for a debugger at a particular point in the methods when something's about to be invoked. Now if the anti-debugger guard gets violated, then what we can do is at level two we have a checksum guard which can validate the integrity of the anti-debug guard itself. And at level three we have a checksum guard which is validating the integrity of checksum level two. Now this is great because if someone's able to identify and remove this one particular thing, you can quickly see how painful this process becomes um, to someone who wants to violate the integrity. They not only have to violate this guy, but they have to go that guy, that guy, that guy, all the way up to the top at level five. Um, it's a very effective strategy for making it as painful as possible. We're not going to guarantee that it's not going to be done, but we want to make it prohibitively expensive. Yep. No. Yeah. So, so what you, the, the next recommended approach is as you move higher in the stack, you reduce the probability of execution of each of these integrity guards. And the idea is you are creating networks of defense which become unpredictable to the attacker. So they may have thought, oh, I just violated this, therefore it works. But, you know, sometime later there's something else which catches it at another runtime perhaps. Creating unstable, and unpredictable integrity protection schemes. Not unstable, just unpredictable. Uh, and the other trick here is we have to make sure that these particular code segments that you're producing don't actually produce consistent binary signatures. If they do produce consistent binary signatures, an attacker will identify those binary signatures and quickly be able to identify where all of that particular type of guard lives within your code and disable it accordingly. So, bi yeah, we'll go into it later, but basically binary signatures um, let you identify particular segments of code. So if your code that implements an anti-debug guard is easily identifiable to an attacker, 
then they can go through the entire image, scan it for these guards and pluck them out basically. Um, so I strongly recommend, this is a new project. We, I started it back in December. It's just getting off the ground uh, and it, it goes into much more depth than we were able to talk about today. It's the reverse engineering and code modification prevention project. It's directly going to connect to the OWASP mobile top 10 2014 under M10. The um, lack of binary protection uh, control which is coming up. And within this umbrella project there's our specific talk focuses on technical risks. Um, so in conclusions, the unauthorized modifications of Android and iPhone apps is extremely prevalent, extremely common and often it's overlooked and just people throw their hands up in the air and say there's nothing that can be done about this problem. You just have to accept it. Uh, it's simply not the case. Uh, and you just have to be really intelligent about how you're implementing and what your control schemes look like and our project is going to educate you on that. So if you have any, I strongly recommend checking out this project for guidance and if anyone wants to contribute any code samples or any ideas or thoughts, I'm totally open to that. Um, right now it's a one man team um, but we're getting interest from the OWASP mobile security group in contributing to this and working with them on their particular stuff. And if you want to reach out directly to me, that's my email address. Uh, and that's my talk at 30 minutes and 50 seconds. <laughs>